The purpose of this lecture is going to be focused on GPS errors and dilution of precision, or DOP. So to start out, I'm going to give you a brief review, just key points from previous lectures that are important to, for this lecture. Then we're going to go into some of the GPS errors for the satellite, the receiver, as well as the signal errors. Following that, we're going to have a discussion of dilution of precision, or DOP. This is going to be really important points that you need to know as well as the mask angle. While the two are related, they are not the exact same. And then we're going to go into, based on the dilution of precision, effective and appropriate GPS planning. So just a reminder about GPS signals in orbit, accurate information about the positions of satellites in space at the moment of the signal transmission is required in order for you to position yourself with a GPS system. So the coordinates of the GPS satellites themselves are transmitted as a function of time, which is the ephemeris, are transmitted as a part of the navigation message. So ideally, satellites travel on Keplerian satellite orbits, which are determined by the Earth's gravitational field. Now, if the Earth was perfectly spherical and of uniform density, then we could consider the Earth as a single mass and the satellites orbit around that mass. However, we know that's not true that the Earth isn't perfectly spherical and it does not have an even distribution of mass. So there's an uneven gravitational field as well as gravity from the Sun and the Moon. There's also external solar radiation pressure, outgassing from satellites, as well as tidal variations and orbital, man orbital maneuvers. All these forces lead to a slightly elliptic orbit with an origin at the center of Earth's mass. So now we're going to talk about GPS errors and PDOP, or dilution of precision as a whole. So just a little bit reminder, accuracy versus precision. Accuracy is the amount by which a measurement or quantity differs from the actual or real world value that it represents. This is different than precision, which is simply the repeatability of measurements, or how tightly grouped those measurements are. So it could be argued that GPS units are precise, at a point in time, but they may not be very accurate at that same point in time, and that's as a result of the control space and user segments all interacting and the errors distributed throughout those three segments. So some of the GPS errors that we're going to cover in this lecture are those specific to satellites, those specific to receivers, and those specific to signal errors. So satellite errors are errors such as the ephemeris or orbital errors, the satellite clock error, the selective availability and anti-spoofing, which remember are no longer around. Selective availability and anti-spoofing have both been discontinued, but you still need to know about them. There's also receiver errors such as the receiver clock error, in other words, how precise the receiver measures time to, how many decimal points. There's multipath error, there's receiver noise error, and then there's antenna phase center variations. For signal errors, you need to know what atmospheric layers delay the signal and how they interact with the signal, as well as geometric location errors. So starting with the satellite errors, the ephemeris error, remember, is when the correct location of a satellite is not transmitted. So in other words, the provided coordinates for a given satellite are not correct. So if these incorrect coordinates are taken as true and you are trying to derive your position on Earth based on these coordinates, you will be calculating an incorrect location. So the incorrect coordinates are different than the predicted path which causes a error in your calculated location. So remember the master control station is responsible for monitoring the orbit of the satellites and updating the satellite position. It calculates a predicted path and uploads all that information to the constellation. In other words, it updates the navigation message. So that updated almanac and ephemeris are uploaded to the GPS receiver via the navigation message. Selective availability is, remember, the intentional manipulation of the broadcast orbit and induced clock error by the Department of Defense. So what this means is that they are intentionally manipulating what the apparent location of the satellite is. 
which ultimately affects the accuracy or your ability to position yourself within that constellation. So the user identifies the wrong orbit, which is the same as an ephemeris error. The difference is that selective availability is intentional and ephemeris error is unintentional. It just occurs through time. So selective availability was a problem until 2000 when it was discontinued. The primary concern now is how many satellites are available at your location at any given time. Also remember there's relativistic effects that affect the satellite clocks. So you have special relativity and general relativity. So remember general relativity you have an increase in time. Special relativity you have a decrease in time. The combined effect of those two is that you get a general increase in time per day. That's on average. So we need to account for this and understand this when determining your position. So the clock speed varies over the elliptic orbit of the satellite. So in other words, the clock speed at the apogee is going to be different than at the perigee. So if we're looking at a satellite at the point of perigee, it's going to have a higher velocity, which causes that satellite clock to run slower than the average clock. Conversely, if you're further away and at the point of apogee, the farthest away point, the satellite is traveling at a slower velocity, which causes the clock to run faster than the average clock. So to account for the relativistic effects, all satellites prior to launch are made to run at a lower frequency, which accounts for this relativity or relativistic effects. Another effect you need to know is the Sagnac effect. And what this is, is during the propagation of the satellite signal, the clock on the surface of the Earth will experience a finite rotation. So if we look at the diagram on the right, we can see that the receiver location when the satellite is transmitted is different than the receiver location when the signal is received. What this means is that Earth's rotation essentially introduces a certain amount of error into the time measurement. So the Sagnac effect overall as it pertains to GPS systems results in a general increase in propagation time at an error of a few meters. In order to correct for this or account for this, we assume that a hypothetical non-rotating reference frame is introduced. In other words, an Earth-centered inertial frame. And this is adopted as the basis for all GPS time. There's also satellite clock errors, in other words, inaccuracy or imprecision with the satellite clocks themselves. So this affects your time of arrival and range calculations. Remember, each satellite has approximately four atomic clocks and they're accurate to the nanosecond, although that's constantly improving. That's one of the bigger improvements in the satellite clocks. So even some instability in the clocks can lead to an error of 3.5 meters. So if we have a satellite clock error of 10 to the negative 8 seconds, that equates to about 3.5 meters of error. However, the average error based on this effect alone tends to be between 1 to 2 meters. So the signals travel from the satellites to the receiver, but in that traveling process, they have to go through a couple different atmospheric layers that actually introduce error into that signal pro propagation. So the first is that ionosphere. And this is a layer where gas molecules are ionized and free electrons interfere with the signal. This layer affects the satellite signal propagation more so than the troposphere. So the ionosphere delay is greatest in the polar regions where the ionosphere is unstable and it's really active. This tends to introduce an error of about two to five meters, depending on where you are. The troposphere is the other atmospheric layer you need to know about. So further delays through the troposphere occur as a result of variations in humidity, temperature, and air pressure refraction. So it's the effects of the troposphere are different than that of the ionosphere based on just the different layers themselves. So the ionosphere is the ionized gas molecules that interfere with the signal propagation. 
troposphere introduces less air of up to about one meter, but that's due to variations in the humidity, temperature, and air pressure. We understand that both these layers affect signal propagation, but how does this vary through time? How does it vary through space? So if we think about a signal traveling from the satellite to the Earth, if it's more perpendicular to the Earth's surface, in other words, if it's near vertical incidence, you tend to have lower amount of error than if it's a low angle of incidence. So here in the diagram on the right, you can see one of the lines is much shorter than the other. It's more perpendicular to the Earth's surface. What this means is that the signal doesn't have to travel through as much of both of those atmosphere layers and that causes less delay or less interference of that signal. Whereas if you are lower on the horizon, that means that the signal has to travel through more of the atmosphere in order to get to your location. So it has more propensity or more opportunity for that satellite signal to be delayed or interfered with. The receiver error is simply rounding discrepancies between a satellite clock and your GPS receiver clock. Remember, your GPS receiver clock is not as accurate in terms of the decimal places that it measures time to. So satellite clocks, based on their expensive atomic clocks, are accurate to about 11 decimal places. This is much better than your GPS receiver clocks, which are simply powered by AA batteries in your case and are only accurate to six decimal places. So this rounding discrepancy introduces an error of about one meter. Another form of error that you need to know about is multipath interference. This is something that is going to play more of a role when you get into effective survey design. And it's basically when the signal is deflected or bounced around like a pinball. And so what this means is that the signal rather than going directly from the satellite to the receiver it's delayed and this can lead to errors of up to two meters in the case of buildings so if you have highly reflective water it can create larger errors of 15 meters or more the nice thing is this can be accounted for to some degree in your survey design so if you know that there's a lot of multipath interference, you can place your receiver sometimes up high, which minimizes or avoids this multipath interference. So here we can see the ideal case where a signal is transmitted from the satellite directly to the receiver. However, the tree in this case is going to interfere with that signal. It's going to bounce around in that tree canopy and cause that signal likely to be delayed. What this is going to mean is your, your GPS receiver is going to calculate an incorrect position based on that incorrect time of arrival. In the other case here, you're also going to get error introduced by the building in this case because that signal, rather than traveling once again directly from the satellite to the receiver, is going to be bounced off that building and be delayed. So what does this mean for surveying? Say you're in jungle surveying, what does this mean for conducting a GPS survey in this environment? What are the issues associated with this environment? Well, if you think about our discussion about multipath interference, you should have a better understanding of why conducting a survey, a GPS survey in a forest can be problematic. The other question is, so what's an issue with conducting a GPS survey on a beach? You don't have any trees around. You don't have your buildings around in this case. So why is this potentially problematic? Remember we talked about that smooth surfaces such as water can introduce actually an even larger air. So it can introduce up to 15 meters or so of air. And that's because if the signal is lower on the horizon, that signal is actually delayed even further as it propagates from the satellite to the receiver. So it essentially bounces off the lake, but because it's such a low angle on the horizon, it's delayed much more significantly than if it's more perpendicular to the earth. And this is once again another representation of that 
we have a satellite low on the horizon transmitting a signal it's reflected off the lake and is delayed even further to the receiver here so now we're going to talk about dilution of precision and this is really key to effective survey design dilution of precision is one of the nice things that we can actually to some degree account for so dilution of precision is simply a measure of the geometric strength of the satellite constellation relative to receiver so it's the position of the satellites from the receiver the stronger the satellite geometry the higher the positioning accuracy and I'll get into what this means in the next several slides here so good satellite geometry is obtained when the satellites are spread out in the sky in other words the more spread out the satellites the better the dilution of precision so here we can see two cases on the right on the top and bottom and I'll talk about why the case on the top has actually a better dilution of precision than the case on the bottom so the receiver transmitter geometry influences dilution of precision or the position precision so in the case on top here it's low dilution of precision the satellites or transmitters as they're displayed here are farther apart they're more spread out and so you have less of an overlap now in the case on the bottom here or B you see it has a high dilution of precision because the transmitters are closer together and although the measurement of uncertainty is the same for each transmitter one and transmitter two the positional uncertainty is considerably larger so if we look at the diagram here the area in orange represents the possible area that the receiver could potentially be in and this is based on timing errors from each of the transmitters or from each of the satellites so you can see there's a smaller area in case A than there is in case B just simply based on how those two spheres or areas overlap and this is all based on a error or a clock offset from the receiver dilution of precision the smaller the dilution of precision the better precision so lower number equals better precision and there's several different types of dilution of precision that you'll see the common one is PDOP that's positional dilution of precision the other ones are geometrical dilution of precision GDOP there's horizontal dilution of precision that's only dealing with the horizontal effects that's HDOP there's a vertical that's only dealing with the vertical component that's VDOP there's also TDOP which is time dilution of precision primarily we're going to focus on positional dilution of precision it incorporates several of the other dilution of precision measures uh, and is really more useful for survey design so PDOP specifically is represents the contributions of satellite geometry to the three-dimensional positioning precision so remember I said there's also horizontal dilution of precision and vertical dilution of precision PDOP incorporates both that horizontal and vertical component so the ideal configuration of satellites for PDOP is when satellites are evenly distributed across the sky so in the case on the right here it's the bottom case so the bottom case with a small PDOP the satellites are evenly distributed represents the ideal case on the top here though the satellites are clustered which means that there's a high degree of overlap within those those spheres that you could potentially be in from each satellite which means that you have a large dilution of precision so this is a case where you try to avoid doing a survey so the other thing is with PDOP it ranges from 0 to 100 now a PDOP of 2 means it has two times the amount of error of a PDOP of 1 so a sharp angle of intersection reduces the effect of errors so here you can see if you're trying to determine your position from the two transmitters the red dots here based on timing errors from each of those satellites you can only determine a potential range that you are from each satellite now plotting those two ranges up from each of those transmitters you get the region in yellow here which you could potentially be in 
So this is an example where you would have a relatively good or high quality PDOP, which means you have a low PDOP number. Conversely, if the satellites are clustered or if they're in line with each other or aligned, you tend to get a small angle of intersection which increases the effect of errors. So here there's a larger area that you could potentially be in just based on the way that those satellites are in line and the error range from each of those satellites. So here's a case where you have a low PDOP number and it's a strong geometric strength. So this is a case where you'd want to conduct a survey as opposed to this case where you have a larger area where those two bands overlap. So you have a larger potential area where you could be. And that's simply based on the distance between the satellites relative to the user or the receiver. So here's an example of a survey or a planning tool that you can use to account for PDOP or different measures of dilution of precision. So Trimble survey systems actually offers a free GNSS planning tool. You can see one of the outputs is here where you pass it your location, the time, and it or returns a graph like this. And there's several other graphs that you'll see uh, a little bit later here. But this is one of the factors that we can account for. And it varies through time. That's important to know. PDOP varies through time as a function of the moving or changing satellite constellation. Now PDOP and mask angle are commonly confused. I want to get it clear. PDOP is not the same as mask angle. Mask angle is not the same as PDOP. However, both of them are affected by the shifting or changing satellite constellation. Mask angle, otherwise known as cutoff angle, is the point above the observer's horizon below which satellite signals are no longer tracked and or processed. In this case, we're talking about direct line of sight. This is typically 10 to 25 degrees. And if you look at the case on the right, if you're in the canyon on the right and you're trying to receive a signal from the satellite here, you're not going to be able to receive that direct line of sight transmission. So here we can see the effects of local topography on the mask angle, where in the case on the top, there's no line of sight reception for the given satellite. In other words, there's a large mask angle that's masking that satellite from being visible by that receiver. So in this case, you have good PDOP. You may have good PDOP, but you have limited availability of the satellites based on the adjacent or surrounding topography or lay of the land. Whereas on the bottom here, you have line of sight reception between the satellite and the receiver. And so you have a small mask angle as it pertains to that satellite. However, if you're looking on the right of the bottom diagram, you see that there's a larger hill. You may have a high mask angle or a large mask angle on the right side. What this means is that while you have a good or may have a good dilution of precision, and availability of satellites on the left, you may not on the right. So mask angle can be highly variable to the left, right, east, west, north, south, um, in all directions. The lay of the land is going to affect your line of sight. So PDOP does not equal mask angle, although the two are related because the satellite constellation is going to be shifting and is going to affect your PDOP as well as your mask angle at the same time. So what happens to the mask angle when the satellite constellation changes? We already covered the case on the lower left here where you can't receive that signal directly. However, let's say that the satellite constellation shifts into the case on the top right here and now you can receive that satellite signal. However, remember when talking about multipath interference, you also have to account for satellite signals bouncing around. So yes, while you may in the upper right here receive a direct signal from the satellite to the receiver, you're also going to receive satellite signals that are going to impact the canyon walls and bounce to the receiver or canyon wall to canyon wall to receiver. And what that's going to mean is that you tend to have more error when measuring your location in canyons such as this. And that's due to the mask angle as it relates to the satellite constellation. 
So the error in your GPS solution is equal to two times the geometry factor, in other words, your dilution of precision, multiplied by your standard deviation of your pseudo range error or your PRN error. And remember, that's simply your time offset. So I talked briefly in a previous slide about GPS planning. So remember there's that Trimble online planning tool. What this means is that the PDOP is going to vary through time and in order to properly use or design a GPS survey, you need to know how that dilution of precision is going to change. So knowing the variation in PDOP or dilution of precision as a whole allows you to properly time your GPS use and survey design in order to reduce your error. So remember this doesn't account for variations in pseudorandom noise error or PRN timing error. It also doesn't account for locally dependent factors such as mask angle. This is another graphic representation you can see here on the top actually you'll see that this survey tool will show you GPS satellites as well as GLONASS, Galileo, Beidou or Beidou 2, and QZSS. And we'll cover more about those systems in a later lecture. However, it's important to know that the survey planning tool is actually more than just simply the GPS satellites. It accounts for GLONASS satellites and Galileo and several other systems. Here's another representation that may be useful to you. So here what it's showing is each colored bar represents when that satellite is visible. So you see the satellites on the left here and the bars running horizontally across from one time to another. Whenever that bar is present or is highlighted on here, that means it's visible to the location that we've put in. So if we look at say 6 a.m., Using the bottom graph, you can see that the yellow satellite at the very bottom, the satellite number one, is not visible. However, satellite three is visible. That bar is filled in, but that disappears after six o'clock. So you need to use these two pieces of information combined to determine when it's most appropriate to do a survey. So based on the chart on the bottom, you can tell how that PDOP is going to vary through time as a function of that changing constellation. You should be able to see here it's to some degree related to how many satellites are visible. However, there's also the distribution of those satellites like that's going to affect your dilution of precision. So it's related to but not the same as the number of satellites available. So if we take a look here, we can see that the PDOP is relatively low. We have a relatively high number of satellites. They're relatively distributed well throughout the sky. Here we can see another low point. So we could say it would be ideal to conduct a survey between these times. You can see PDOP is low. Your, all your measures of dilution and precision are low. You have a relatively high number of satellites visible in the sky. Whereas if we look at the second window highlighted here, we can see that there's fewer satellites available. The PDOP is slightly higher. In this case, you could argue to conduct a survey, but it's a little bit more variable, your dilution of precision. So you may have error affecting it differently throughout that, sur throughout that survey. If we look at the third window, this large chunk here, between about 10 o'clock and say 4 o'clock, you can see that the PDOP is all over the place. It's really high. The satellites are kind of sparse in terms of their visibility. This would be a time span when we would not want to plan a survey. If we look at the total electron content, this is a measure of how active the ionosphere is. In other words, areas where it's more red, the ionosphere is more charged, you tend to get more error. And remember I said this is going to change as a function of time. Why is this going to change as a function of time? If you think about the Earth's rotation and what parts are day, what parts of the Earth are night, the ionosphere is going to be charged differentially or preferentially on the side closest to the sun and it's going to vary as you move away from that. 
So now we covered a brief review of Keplerian orbit and what that means for satellite errors. We also covered several different types of GPS errors, including satellite errors, receiver errors, signal errors, and what each of those are. You need to know the different types of errors covered here, as well as what the dilution of precision is, what the common measure of DOP is, so in other words, PDOP, but also what the other measures are, and what the mask angle is, and how the two are related but different. So I might ask a question, how is dilution of precision and mask angle related, and how are they different? And you should be able to answer that question. The last part that I covered is how to plan for effects of dilution of precision. So remember, GPS planning, that Trimble planning tool, does not account for local errors. It only accounts for dilution of precision error.